everyone. Uh, this is Janie Cook, and I'm teaching the ordination class uh, poetic books. And so uh, I want to get started here with our syllabus and uh, give you an idea as to what is required for this class. Some of you are return students, and it's good to see you. And for those of you who this is your first time, I'm Dr. Cook's wife. And uh, we've been in ministry together for over um, almost about 46 years almost. So God bless you. And um, I am an ordained minister. And uh, we have ministered in Tennessee, in California, uh, Washington State, and in other locations where we've been privileged to speak as well as overseas and, and in Mexico. Okay, um, so the syllabus for this class, you should have already received it and have it right there in front of you on your um, computer or, you know, print it out. This is a study of the five poetry or wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesi Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. Uh, some poetical books courses do not cover the book of Job, only the others, or, uh, but uh, Pastor Dr. Cook uh, wants to cover all of them because they are really uh, in that category. So in this class, we will be dealing with issues like suffering, marriage, parenting, the fear of the Lord, wisdom for living, and many other uh, issues. So this course is designed to help the student in their own walk with God and in ministering to others who need instruction as well as an un a better understanding of these books. Um, remember, this is an ordination class. Take it seriously and give it your full attention. As 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. And so I'm sure that that's your heart and desire. This is a requirement for ordination classes to receive, uh, you know, prior to receiving ordination when you're qualified. Okay, the course objectives. Upon successful completion of this course, you should be able to understand the purpose behind the writings of the poetic and wisdom books, identify key themes such as suffering, parenting, the fear of the Lord, diligence, um, wisdom, wealth, marriage, and many others. You should also be able to begin identifying the genre of any given psalm, explain the origin of psalm titles as well as their significance regarding the authorship and date of composition, list several of the smaller collections that make up for the book of psalms, Review the process of the compilation of the Psalter. Explore and identify parallelism as well as poetic devices found in any given psalm. Apply the themes and messages found in the poetic wisdom literature. Apply them to your own life and to those you minister to. Prepare sermons from these books that are relevant and applicable to today's population. That's the most important thing. Are, is this relevant to us today? And is it relevant to those that we minister to? Um, and how can we convey the truths of these books? How can we convey what God is saying to us and apply those to our lives? Okay, our text for this course is uh, the book by C. Hassel Bullock. An introduction to the Old Testament poetic books and of course the Holy Bible especially in different translations I'd like for you to read these books uh, in a modern translation like the New Living Translation uh, something like that um, along with your King James or uh, New King James or NIV or whatever and yes the NIV is a up-to-date translation but even if it's obscured there uh, look it up in an in the NLT or something 
uh, many of you I know have um, um, today's Bible. What's it called? Anyway, I have it on my phone. Uh, uh, the one that you know you can read in any translation, so you can pull up and read from uh, various translations there. Uh, one thing I do want to say about uh, this textbook, because I've taught this class before, and uh, I know the textbook, I've read it. Uh, it is, um, it has a lot of um, great information, but I do want you to know it is written from an academic standpoint. Uh, I was a English and literature major in college. Um, and I studied a lot of literature and backgrounds of literature, that kind of thing. And um, a lot of this that Bullock has put here has a lot to do with just the academic side of literature and the academic side of poetry and um, all that, more than the spiritual aspect. So I, I will be lecturing you more on the spiritual aspect than I will on the academic because you have that in the textbook. All right, and and uh, some of that is important, but it is not the most important thing. So um, your course requirements, uh, your participation in this class, and because you're this, the syllabus says directed study, which this is like directed study, only you get the benefit of a live lecture or a recorded lecture, let's say. Uh, so. I ask you to check in at least once a week. I need you to email me um, or, you know, text me if needed uh, with a, a question or a comment or say I'm, you know, I just something to do with the class or the textbook, like I, something that you may want to bring up or comment to me or ask me a question. Anything like that. Once a week, I'd, I'd like for you to uh, contact me, and that is your um, attendance and participation in this class, and it's worth 20%. Uh, your reading is worth 20%, so I would like you to not only read your textbook, but also read the corresponding books each week. This book, we're in the book of, of Job. We're studying the book of Job this week, so you're in the ministry. Read the book of Job and uh, read the comments in the book on that section. And then each week you will do the same. With the books that we study, read the corresponding pages in the book. Okay, uh, then third, our weekly assignments. Uh, you're going to have some Q&As that I will send out um, uh, for you. Uh, and I will send the Q&A for Job a little later in a couple of days. And uh, you will uh, have to get that back to me. Okay. Um, you may ask, can my checking in uh, once a week, my contact once a week, be in conjunction with me sending back the Q&A? Yes, it can. But I would like some comments more than the Q&A. Like when you send the q and I'd like for you to comment, oh, um, I... I'm enjoying reading Job. I, I learned some things from this. Um, um, I didn't agree with the author on such and such, or it seems this was tedious, or da 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 da. Some kind of comment in addition to your Q&A will count for your contact to me that week in the same, you know, when you send it back, okay? So I hope that's not confusing. Uh, and then in, uh, and that counts your assignments, getting your assignments back in are 30% of your grade. So that's important. Uh, since we're not in the classroom every week, this is this is vital. Your examination at the end, uh, after four weeks of class, will be 30% of your grade. Okay, so you see the uh, each week there. Uh, first week we're doing Job. Second week Psalms, and then there's a you know Psalms is a long book, 150 Psalms, but they're easy to read. And you can divide it up during your read, your week and read so much. And I know Job is a long book as well. Uh, so you get the first two long books over with in the first two weeks. And then we go on to Proverbs, third week. The fourth week is Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. And I don't want to go blank on you here. Um, 
and then the fifth week is the final exam. And uh, I will be sending out a study guide after the fourth week uh, for you to be prepared for the final exam. All right, and then my contact uh, information is there at the end. Uh, there's no there's no term paper due on this because that's why you have the Q&As every week. Instead of a term paper or some kind of other project like that, it's Q&A on these uh, books. Okay, and on your textbook. There will be some questions in there about regarding your something in the textbook. But you, that's an open book. Your Q&As are open book, open Bible. So, um, you know, you just have to take time to sit down and do it. And if you have any questions uh, on this, you know, email me. Um, and I'll get back to you. So, uh, let's just have a word of prayer and we'll get into Job. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you. For who you are and I thank you Lord um, for this opportunity to teach students in ministry or going into ministry from your word and I Lord I just defer to you you are the great teacher and you're the writer of the book Holy Spirit you're the one that inspired and the writers to write what God was saying and what he was teaching us and training us so Lord we just look to you for your instruction and your teaching Teach us, Holy Spirit, and may it be clear to us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory. Amen. Okay, let's just begin here. Um, I've got my notes. Um, the setting on earth. We'll begin with Job chapters 1 and 2. I'm not going to read down through every verse because that's what you're to do. I'm just going to give you a, a jumping off point and give you some background and then you'll have your Q&A's to go through and study and you believe me you will learn something from this course so, so the setting on earth at this time in, in Job chapter chapters 1 and 2 we see here that Job who's the main character is a righteous man and a man of integrity which is a what a what a wonderful thing to be said of any of us that we are righteous before God and have a heart of integrity. You can't say anything better than that about someone. And this man, his ways pleased the Lord. And this was similar to God's evaluation of Enoch uh, from Genesis who walked with God. But we see Job here, a righteous man, a man of integrity. He had seven sons, which was a blessing in those days. Uh, until the last couple of centuries, maybe, you know, um, people depended on just uh, maybe the last, uh, this century, the last one, and the one before it. Before that, uh, families mostly depended on um, their own family working together to provide for themselves, to provide from their farm, from their cattle, from their woodworking, you know, as a carpenter. Uh, whatever it was that they could do that uh, brought them income or that they could trade with someone for the things that they needed. And if they had many sons, then all the sons uh, were involved in the family business and it was a great blessing and helped bring in more income for all of them, you know. And they had strong men to work and help with that. So Job was blessed with seven sons, three daughters, he owned 7,000 sheep. I mean, can you, 7,000 sheep. Uh, just think of all the uh, grass and that they would need to feed 7,000 sheep. Lots of pasture. 3,000 camels. Wow. Whew. 500 teams of oxen. That means 1,000 oxen because these are 500 teams. And oxen were always yoked together, two oxen together. 500 female donkeys. Wow. He had many household servants. 
and he was the wealthiest man in the area. So that's Job, okay? And that's where we find him. And we find out another thing about Job. His children like to party. Now, does that sound like our day and age? How many, oh, how many um, godly parents and grandparents that I know today who are praying for their children and grandchildren because they're not dedicated to the Lord. They they don't attend church much. They're all into the party scene. And uh, may, they may, some of these are not like bad people. They're not get, getting thrown in jail all the time like some, you know, but they're, they're just, they obey the law. They, they work hard. They're diligent. They take care of their families, but they're not dedicated to the Lord, their lives or their children, and they just party. And so Job had these children, and they had a party, you know, going all the time. And he was very concerned, and he should have been. It doesn't say that his wife was concerned, that Job's wife was concerned, or that she's the one that prayed for them. No, it says that he was the one concerned. And continually, after every party, he would offer sacrifices for them and pray for them in case they had sinned, in case they had sinned or cursed God. And he was constantly praying and interceding for them and uh, asking forgiveness, sacrificing for their sins whatever they might be. And I'm sure there I'm sure it wasn't just, you know, uh, a figment of his imagination. I'm sure there were times that they these children did sin in their lifestyle. And so we see though the heart of a parent that he is concerned about his children. He's not just ignoring it or saying, "Well, whatever, you know, you do your thing, I'll do mine." You know, I don't care, you know just so you come home at night. No, it was way more than that. And it kind of, you know, gives us a picture of our our Father God's heart, a picture of his heart. Is he going to just let people go to hell and say, well, that's your thing, nothing to me, that's your choice? Of course not. That That is not God's attitude at all. That's what some people think, but that is not God's attitude. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he was God was so concerned about us, about mankind, that he came himself, gave his only son to die for us that we could be saved. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. And, he, and the Bible tells us that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we see the same kind of heart. Job is not willing for his children to perish. He wants them saved. He wants them, you know, not condemned. He doesn't want them to end up uh, without God. And so he's sacrificing for them. But he's constantly in fear that of this and constantly sacrificing for them and praying for them. Okay, now let's go to the setting in heaven. The setting in heaven. We see the heavenly court is in session. Some people, you know, don't even think about there being a heavenly court. But of course there is a heavenly court, and God is the righteous judge. And we see that um, there's different um, ones that come before God, different of his creation, and, and the King James even says the sons of God. And Satan, the accuser, the, the Bible calls him the accuser. Believe me, there's something wrong when we get into accusations. Um, you say, well, what do you do if you know someone's doing something and you need to report it? That's different. Reporting a crime or reporting a uh, something to the pastor that needs to be addressed, that's a whole different uh, thing. No, someone who's always making accusations, uh, oh, she's so, you know, um, I, th I think she's not right. I just don't feel right about her. She makes me sick, you know. Um, he's, um, you ought to check into him, you know. I don't think he's paying all of his tithes or, you know, whatever it might be. Those are accusations that you have nothing to back it up. And if you know 
that someone's not doing right. But it's not a, it's not something you should bring uh, bring to, uh, you know, a pastor yet or whatever. If it is, you have to do that. You're under obligation. But if it's something that is just one of their character flaws or something they're messing up on right now, and they need a little time for God to deal with them, begin to pray and intercede for them. Pray and intercede, and and then ask God how wow well, you should deal with this. What should you do? Should you do any more than pray and intercede? And have a heart for them. Have a, com a heart of compassion for them that doesn't just want to see them accused and condemned and, you know, put out or put down or whatever. What are, what are we in this for? Are we there to, as James says, rescue a fallen brother or sister? Are we there to help rescue them? Or are we there to condemn them and knock them down? What is our objective? What's in our heart? Well, I can tell you one thing. If we're going around accusing people all the time, making accusations and condemning people, who are we following? We're following someone called, whose name is the accuser. And that's not God's name. So Satan, the accuser, comes to present himself before the Lord, along with the others there. And the Lord asks him, where have you come from? And Satan gives his answer, paroling the earth back and forth and watching you know, everything there. And God asked him, well, since you were there, did you notice my servant Job? God is bragging on Job. He loves this guy. He said, did you notice him? He's fine. He's blameless. The King James says perfect. It means his heart was right before God. In a man full of integrity. He fears me. He stays away from evil. He stays away from it. He you know, he will not, he, he runs away from evil. He avoids it. He doesn't dabble in it. He's not on the fence. He's not, oh, I can watch this and it'll be okay. Oh, I can pull that up and it'll be okay. Oh, I can listen to that and it'll be okay. No, no. Job stays away from it. He's got a perfect heart toward God. And so when the Lord says that, he's bragging on Job and he says that to Satan. Satan replies, here, see, here's this sarcastic, accusing, envious, jealous person. And he says, well, no wonder you have protected him. You know, he's encompassed with his protection on all sides. You have made him to prosper in everything he does. He's wealthy. He's wealthier than anyone around. But if you take all that away, he will curse you to your face. Well, the Lord, he think, the Lord knows in his heart, no, this man will never curse me because I know his heart and it is toward me. No matter what I've done for him, he loves me first. And he truly worships me from his heart. He truly, sincerely follows me from his heart. No, there's no way. So the Lord says, okay, we'll just see. If you, if that's your accusation, your attitude, all right, I give you permission to touch his stuff, but you cannot touch his health. You can take, uh, I give you permission to take any of his stuff and touch it, but you cannot touch him physically. Well, Okay, so what do we see here in this little inter, uh, change, this, uh, exchange here in, chapters, in chapter 1? Uh, we see, number one, that God is the blesser. God is the giver. God is the protector. Okay? God is the provider and the source of all good and wonderful things. Satan is the accuser, the destroyer, and the taker. That's what we see. And isn't that what Jesus said in John 10? John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So, once again, 
we see the Old Testament agreeing with the New Testament and Jesus repeating exactly what God is showing us right here. So anyway, so Satan has his permission to touch Job, uh, touch his stuff. So he gets right to work immediately that day. Literally, all hell breaks loose on Job and his family. In that one day, nothing is left. He loses everything, even his children, his 10 children. He loses them all. Well, I mean, in one day, who wouldn't be completely, grief stricken is not even the word. Um, it, it, would be, it would be the most, tor talk about a horrible day. Talk about the worst day of your life multiplied by a thousand. There are no words to describe how he must have, Felt what must have been his. It's horrible. They, you know, any of you, if you have children, or some of you may have grandchildren. I don't know. We have three children. We have uh, just uh, just about twelve grandchildren. We have one soon to be born in May. If something like this happened to us, we lost everything and all of our children and grandchildren in one day. Oh my goodness. There's no words to describe. There are no words. Well, Job is, he's completely just, you know, he can't even wrap his head around it. He can't even, he doesn't, it's just, can't even accept it. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of this complete, and total, you know, just grief. He bows to God. He bows and worships God. You see that there. And he will not curse God. And he begin. And he, and he says, "I praise you, Lord." Anyway, in other words, that's what we'd say in the, this modern day and age. In, ver, in chapter one, verse twenty-two, I'm going to quote here. In, from the NLT, in all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. The King James says, in all this, Job did not sin nor char charge God foolishly. How many times have we or we know someone who have charged God foolishly? God did this to me. God did that to me. God took this one. God took that one. And we charge God foolishly. We see here, it's clear in these, in these first two chapters, God gave Satan permission to touch Job, but God didn't do the taking. And he makes it very clear. And verse 22, don't ever forget this verse of chapter 1. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God or charging God foolishly. So may we remember that for ourselves and pass it on. To others that we teach and minister to. So, okay, the next day in heaven, we see that since God didn't, since Job didn't curse God and to blame him for the destruction, Satan comes before the Lord again. And he brings this accusation to, to the Lord and says, if, if, you'll, if you will allow me to touch him physically, to take away his health, then he will curse you. And so the Lord, knowing Job's heart and knowing he's really serving him because he just loves God, he says, okay, you have permission to touch him physically, but you cannot take his life. And that was the, you know, the boundary. God says, you cannot take his life. So, Two questions that come apparently clear here. And I just went over them earlier, but who is revealed as the, as the destroyer in this situation? Who's the destroyer unleashing the affliction on Job? Satan. And who is confident of Job's absolute loyalty and integrity, no matter what? God. His father, Father God, he is absolutely confident of Job's 
integrity and his absolute loyalty, loyalty to him, his love for him. He knows our hearts. He's the God who knows every heart. Okay, so the next many chapters uh, are about Job's complaints and then, you know, responses to that. And I, I want to go through that just briefly because you're going to read it and you're going to have questions and answers on it. And uh, we see, you know, with so much pain and suffering and loss and in those couple of days, Job began finally to curse the day he was born. I wish I'd never been born. He's groaning and crying, you know, and he's unable to grasp and accept what's happening to him. I mean, who would? Who would? What's going on here? I mean, it's, you know, the worst case scenario times a thousand, like I said. So he's cursing the day he was born. And I would... I would venture to say that most all of us would be doing the same thing. And then I want you to note what he says in verse in chapter 3, verse 25. Here's these words. He says in verse 25 of chapter 3, What I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. So we see we get a clue here about something that was going on in Job's heart. Here was a man of integrity, a man who loved God, who ran away from evil, who really, truly loved God with all of his heart, was sincere, wasn't a put on, wasn't a fake, wasn't doing it for what he could get out of God. But in his heart was this fear. He says, what I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come upon me. So we see here a revelation about something that was in Job's heart that he didn't even realize it. I mean, he didn't speak it out loud, maybe. And maybe he did. Maybe he said many times. Maybe he said it around his wife or his children. You know, who knows? But the fear was there. And what he had dreaded all this time came to pass. How did this open a door for the enemy? It does. Fear. Can fear open a door to the enemy? Yes. Of course. Absolutely. Uh, in Timothy, we're told, God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So the spirit of fear doesn't come from God. And Job had this fear in his heart. This It was just embedded there. And he dreaded this thing that had happened to him. So fear can definitely open a door to the enemy and give him place. Even if we're pure in heart, even if we're walking in the ways of the Lord, even if we're following him, we need to uh, check in. Our, check our own heart with the help of the Holy Spirit. Is there anxiety and fear there? You know, Philippians 4 tells us, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God with thanksgiving. And then the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind in him. There's fear in this world. There's fear of things going wrong. There's fear of failure. There's fear of things happening. There's all kinds of fear around, and it can get on the inside of us. It can grow up with us. Maybe we came from a home where fear was spoken constantly, fearful of this and fearful of that, or, oh, that's going to happen to me, or, oh, yeah, that's just, yeah, that's my lot. That's my luck. Just my luck. I knew it. Fear that we're speaking, that we're holding on to, and it can open a door to the enemy. We, we need to realize that. We need to be aware of that. And we need to cast out fear. And the Bible tells us how. Perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love. Where is that perfect love found? In God. It's not always found in our society, of course. In fact, very little. It's not always found even in the church. Perfect love. It's closer than anywhere else, or it should be. Perfect love is not always found in our home or our spouse or even from our 
uh, children or our parents. If we're expecting perfect love from flesh and blood, we're going to be disappointed over and over and over again. Where does that perfect love come from? From God. Agape love. He is love. The more that we walk in God, the more we walk in love. And the less we walk in fear. The more that we follow God and follow his ways, think like he thinks, renew our mind to his word and to his ways, the more and more that we walk in him and in his love, the less and less fear there is. We can rebuke fear in our lives. We don't have to let it stay there. We can rebuke it. We can look up scriptures and speak them out, uh, confess them, stand upon them, that we don't have to fear. God is with us. He will never leave us or forsake us and that he is our rear guard and that he protects us. Look at the verses from Psalm 91 about all the reasons why we don't have to fear. If we if we abide in the under the shadow of the Almighty, if we stay and live under his wings, there's no reason for fear. We don't have to fear other people and what they're going to do to us or what they say they're going to do to us or what they could do to us. And maybe it is possible. Maybe these aren't ungrounded fears. But there's someone higher than those people. There's someone higher than those courts. There's someone higher than those words or those uh, threats. And it's the Lord God Almighty, our Heavenly Father, El Shaddai, the God who's more than enough. He's there for us. He's there for our children. He's there for our grandchildren. He's there for our parents and our family. He will supply us with what we need. He will supply us with the the needed love, the needed respect, the needed honor, the needed backup, uh, the needed finances, the needed provision, whatever it is, he will supply it. He is perfect love. Not these other people, not these other places, not these other sources. He's our source. And once we get that straight, then we will not walk in fear. And when it tries to come on us, we'll recognize it and just rebuke it and begin to praise God for his provision for us. Praise God that he's taking care of us. Praise God that we have nothing to fear. And uh, so we see that fear is crippling, it's paralyzing, and it if it continues in our life, it can really open a door to the enemy. And that's what happened in Job's life. And uh, let's go on here and just summarize Job's three, we could call them fake friends. <laughs> you ever had any fake friends? Those people that says, yeah, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. But they're not there when you need them. And, you know, sometimes people can't always be there for us. They have their own issues. They have things they're dealing with. And I'm not trying to put down, you know, we can't be everything to everybody. That's why we do need to rely upon the Lord and let him be our perfect uh, love, our perfect source, our source of everything that we need in every way. But these friends had the wrong heart. They didn't even have the right heart. I've, I've had friends who had good hearts, wonderful people, would do anything for me, but they couldn't always help me. They had other obligations, you know. But these guys, mm, their heart was wrong. And uh, I'm going to name these three. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Zophar, the Namathite, and Bildad, the Shuhite. These were the friends of Job, the three that... There were four friends actually that came to comfort him, but three of them who really missed it. And uh, in the very first uh, discord, the very beginning of Eliphaz, uh, his statements, his words to Job, it reveals something about Job. He says there, uh, you are known all around as an encourager. Listen to this. This is how Job is known. He's known as an encourager. He strengthens the weak. He supports those who are falling. What a wonderful testimony. This was a testimony that Job had in around his whole community there, that whole area. Job is a great guy. I mean, he's really the real deal. And... Eliphaz mentions that and co commends him for that. That's the last thing he says that's <laughs> decent. Okay, then he goes on to say, um, and, in, and in modern language in the NLT it says, he says, my experience shows 
though, blah, blah, blah. My experience tells me that here's what's wrong with you. Uh, you would not have this trouble if. And then he goes on for chapters and chapters and verses and verses. And um, it reminds me of a scripture from Proverbs 3. You know, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. It will be health to your navel and marrow to your bones. That's the King James Version. Be not wise in our own eyes. So this Eliphaz, he's going, it's my experience, in my experience. In other words, he was very wise in his own eyes. And he knew, he knew everything. Nobody could tell him anything. He was a very, very prideful person. And he went on to begin his accusations of Job and what was wrong with him and what brought this on. And uh, then Zophar, the Namathite, he pretty much did the same thing, made more accusations, and, and then Bildad, the Shuite. All three of these, when you read through there, I want you to read through all their accusations and everything, and then Job, you know, he answered here and there back to them and, but you can see it coming through so strong. These men hated Job because they were they had been so jealous of this man. They were jealous and envious of this man who was so wealthy, who had such a great thing going, and, and he was such a wonderful guy, and there were nobody could say anything against him. He really was the real deal. I mean, they hated him. When somebody's envious and jealous of of anyone they hate him they that's hatred jealousy and envy is a terrible thing that's what that's what caused lucifer to fall and get thrown out of heaven he envied god if you envy someone you hate him you hate him to the point that his satan lucifer wanted god's position he didn't want god to be there he wanted to put himself there and annihilate god if that's not hatred i don't know what it is I mean, he could not stand God, couldn't stand to see him anymore, couldn't stand to worship him. No, I want to be there in that place, and I'm going to have that worship. Envy and jealousy is a terrible thing, and it is, and there's complete hatred at the bottom of it. Complete hatred. In fact, there's complete murder. If, if, if Lucifer's wanting God's place, God can't be there anymore. What is he doing? He's murdering God. In his heart, he's murdering God. He's taking him out of his position. He's pushing him out of that position. I, that's a terrible thing. I, I, I don't know how many times through the years that we have seen this happen in ministry where someone uh, in ministry on staff or another, maybe they weren't on staff at a church, but a lot of times on staff, uh, some pastor on staff wants the senior pastor's position and takes it over by force one way or another, splits the church, you know, whatever. Or a pastor um, comes in from somewhere else or in, somewhere else in the area and, um, you know, I'm going to obliterate that guy in his church because I'm going to build mine bigger, you know, whatever. But anyway, I remember one time, um, I could tell you many examples, and I could tell you examples that happened to us, but I'll tell you one that happened to my dad. My dad was a a pastor and a minister, and I'm from Tennessee, and he pastored mostly in Tennessee, but in a couple of other states as well, and he's gone on to be with the Lord now, and uh, anyway, the last church that he pastored, and, and actually, I could tell you more examples of, of, the, of this type of thing that happened to my dad in his ministry before, but I'm telling you the last one that happened to him. He was the senior pastor of a small AG Church in a small Tennessee town. When I say a small Tennessee town, the population is about 2,000, 2,500. 2,000 people. 
and um, uh, the church had sometimes um, had, you know, attendances of maybe 150 or 200 on an Easter Sunday through the years. And, but anyway, so my dad, um, after he came and began pastoring, they regularly ran over 100 all the time. And uh, he was, you know, he was in his later years, but he was still teaching. My dad was also a teacher and had been a principal uh, because um, he pioneered churches and he had to have extra income. And um, so uh, they weren't receiving a full salary from that church. And so my dad's teaching and uh, was, you know, subsidized all that. And the church was growing. People were being saved. My dad was a real soul winner. He was like an evangelist. My dad was a real evangelist. And he would win people to the Lord in the hospitals and different places. You know, he was just a soul winner. And when he preached, it was a soul winning message so much of the time. And uh, um, anyway, they were doing really good. They were there for, I think, about 10 years. And... Uh, um, in the last year there, uh, this young um, minister and his wife that we even knew them, you know, they were known around there. They were from an adjoining community, uh, kind of up the hill, but it wasn't that far, you know, maybe within 20 miles or 15 miles. And uh, uh, my dad had had him come and speak sometimes. He was younger, you know, and he also... Um, had another, he, he worked at another uh, a business uh, to support his family because he just, you know, uh, went around and held meetings. And in these small Tennessee towns, so there wasn't enough income to support him from the churches. So anyway, um, actually his, this young man, his wife had been a babysitter for my husband and I at one point with our young children many year, many years ago. So um, they came, they started coming to my dad's church, and he went to him just with the sweetest attitude, big smile, and said, you know, my wife and I want to come here and help you. We want to help you here. And my dad was just overjoyed. He was so excited that they had a younger couple that wanted to come alongside and help them, and, and he would let him preach. And then, Well, about six months into this, they'd been there about six months, then all of a sudden he showed his colors and his whole his whole plan the whole time had been that he wanted to have the church and be the pastors and have that income the income that was there and and the uh, you know a stable ministry ongoing ministry and uh, he stirred up the people you know, this man's too old, and, you know, you, you need a younger person, da, da 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 So they voted my dad out, or I think my dad actually just resigned when he saw what was going on. I'm, I'm pretty sure he resigned, and he left brokenhearted. That's the last church he ever pastored. And um, he was about, I think then he was about 70, or getting close to 70. I think he was about 70, and uh, he was still in good shape. My dad was in real good shape. He took care of himself. He took care of his body. He ran and walked, and you know, and he was on fire for the Lord, and he was teaching. Anyway, this young man couldn't make it at that church. After about another six months, he just up and left the church one day and just left them high and dry exactly what happened you know if God has something for us if he has a promotion then let him do it don't ever put someone else down to put yourself up the Bible says when we humble ourselves before God then he will exalt us humility always comes before promotion uh, remember David and Saul David, God had anointed David. This happens so many times to young ministers. They get anointed by the Lord. They're called into ministry. They're anointed. They're really called. They have all these giftings. I mean, they're just, 
you know, they think they're God's gift to the church and the world. And I mean, everybody's been young. We all have had those aspirations. We and we have we feel the calling and the anointing of God and we're we're just ready. We've got all this zeal. We want to do something. We want to change the world. And but there's still an anointed person and a called person in the position where God's leading us or where we think he might take us, just like David and Saul. But Saul, even though he was wrong, and even though he had erred from where he should be, the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. God doesn't reverse them. And he was still God's anointed in that position. And David said, I will not touch God's anointed. And David went through several years of really hard trials, running from Saul, having to move his own, his family. He had to move his mother and dad because their life was in danger. He had to go into enemy territory. I mean, it was horrible. You read there, it was horrible what happened to David. But at the right time, God brought him back and put him exactly where he was supposed to be and made him king. And David did not had not had to lift his hand against Saul. Because I will tell you, when God was in heaven and Lucifer was leading the rebellion against him with a third of the angels, how do you think God felt when Lucifer wanted his position? The next time you think about taking somebody else's position, you just remember Lucifer in heaven trying to take God's position and remember David and Saul. And by the way, one of the best books you can read on this subject is A Tale of Three Kings. And I know some of you uh, students who have been with us for a while, you know, uh, you had to read that book. It was required. Uh, but if you haven't read the book, please read the book, A Tale of Three Kings, because it's it says it so well. It shows the heart of David and Saul and Absalom, and we never want to be a, a Saul or an Absalom. Okay, well, that's another whole message, isn't it? But don't forget these words, and remember that Envy and jealousy are terrible things, and they're not ordained of God. And you know, sometimes these situations comes up, you'd say, well, if God wasn't wanting me to have that position or have that church or, you know, if he wasn't wanting me to take it over and he's given me this gifting and calling and it looks so clear to me, why would he, why would it be right here available for me or, you know, for my takeover? Because he's testing you. It's a test. It's a test from heaven. He's testing to see what's in your heart. Are you going to do the right thing? So Job's friends were not true friends at all. And we see that then there was this younger guy, Elihu, Elihu, the, the Buzzite or Buzite. I don't know how they would say it, but he was the youngest and he waited until the elders had spoken. And, you know, in that culture and even to this day in the Asian Eastern culture over there, it's a big thing if you're the elder and you're supposed to show respect to the elders. And, and it would we would do so much better in America if that was true here across the board. We have lost so much ground in regards to respect and honor of our elders, of our uh, those over us, of our mentors, of, of God. I mean, it's sad. And so we see he had a he had an honorable heart. Elihu had an honorable heart. And he waited until the elders had spoke. And then he said, since I was the youngest, I waited to hear you all. And now I would like to say something. And, and so he did this in a, a respectful way. Uh, and uh, when he spoke, he said, I am very angry. I am angry at you three men for your accusations against Job. And he begins to tell them, this isn't right for you to say to him. And your treatment of him, he, he saw their hearts. 
Eli, he saw their hearts. And, and so he, he, he said that and he was clear and he was honest about it. And he did it in the right way. And it was true what he said. And, but he was also angry at Job for Job's self-righteousness and defensive posture. Job was a good man, and he was a righteous man, and he, and he followed the ways of the Lord, and he, and he continued to worship the Lord and praise him in the midst of all that. But he was also a man of flesh and blood. He was human, just like all of us. And there was, there was the fear there that we saw, and here was this pride that caused the self-righteousness and this de defensive posture. In many things that Job said, he uh, was right on, and it was very, very good. But some things that he said were, you know, he was defending himself in self-righteousness. And uh, it was clear. And so Elihu spoke truly. Um, one of the things that I do want to point out, though, before we go any further, is in chapter 19, uh, verse 21, as well as other passages. There's other passages throughout. I'm just quoting this one. We see that Job, who does Job feel is responsible for his affliction? Even though he didn't blame God, his emotions were beginning to take toll on him. And then his wife, <coughs> excuse me, Job's wife says, you know, after all this happened in the there in the second and third chapter, why don't you just curse God and die? Just curse him and die. Look what, you know, it it hasn't done a thing for you to serve God all these years. Da, 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 da. I mean, what a horrible, what a horrible woman that instead of saying, let's go to the Lord and, and seek his face, because he's been so good to us. Look how good he's been to us all these years. And We've been so blessed. There's got to be more to this than we can see. Let's go to the Lord. And No, she didn't take that posture. Mm -mm. Curse God and die. So you have all this going on around him. You have all these friends, these friends accusing him day and night. And him in this dire physical condition. It was horrible. He's sitting by the side of the road, you know, scraping off these sores with a piece of clay. And just in absolute pain and suffering and torment day and night. I mean, oh, these hor boils are horrible. But Job had a feeling that maybe this affliction might be because of something God was mad at him about. But of course, that's not true. And he finds it out. But in um, the ninth chapter of Job, and I want you to really be sure that you, um, and you'll have some Q&A on this. In the ninth chapter of Job, there are some, uh, and the 13th chapter, let's see. The ninth chapter, if you're taking notes, the 13th chapter and the 35th chapter of Job. Those three chapters, 9, 13, and 35. I'm going to sit down for just a moment. Um, you will notice some amazing scriptures they're amazing uh because it's pre-christ this is the pre-christ era you know all almost all bible scholars agree that job was the first book that was ever written even before moses wrote down uh genesis through deuteronomy even you know even before he wrote those down that they feel job was the very first book ever written and so i mean but Regardless, this is way back centuries before Christ ever came. And so in, in Job chapter 9 and chapter 13 and chapter 35, we see Job longing for and requesting something. And it was even in the pre-Christ era. And it's just, it's amazing. So I want you to be sure and, and you know, notice those chapters because you'll have some questions on that. And then also in chapters 14 and 19, chapters 14 and 19, Job speaks of a hope there that he obviously believes in. And it is absolutely remarkable at this point in history. It's absolutely remarkable that Job is speaking 
of this in chapters 14 and 19. Also, we see that um, Job's character is revealed uh, prior to his affliction, that his character is revealed in uh, several of the following passages, and, and I will, this will be in your Q&A as well coming up. Chapter 29, there's some verses there that reveal Job's character. Chapter 30, 31, uh, and thir yeah, in chapters 29, 30, and 31, reveal a lot of detail about Job's character, more than just, you know, in the first few verses of the first chapter. What a, what a great man of God. But in chapters 38 through 41, we see God's answer to Job. And I want you to read those well. I want you to read those chapters. God's answer to Job. Uh, and he answers Job when, when God speaks to him. When Job speaks to God, this is what I want to know And in several of his discourses. And then God answers him in chapters 38 through 41. And I want you to notice God's willingness to answer Job. As Job requested. He said, if I could just speak with God, if, I could, if he would just answer me. God answers him as Job requested. <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't a father answer his son? God is a wonderful heavenly father. And the more that we get to know him through his word and through walking with him and him revealing himself to us, the more that we understand that. Why would God take the time to personally respond to one person? That reveals a lot about God. He's, he's just awesome. He will take the time to respond to one person. He sent Philip down in, in the wilderness there to that eunuch. He was just a lowly eunuch from Ethiopia who served the queen. But God took Philip from a big evangelistic meeting and translated him all the way down into the desert there to speak to that eunuch about the Lord Jesus Christ and salvation and baptize him in water. My goodness, what a wonderful God we have. Uh, and note, too, that in chapter 42 of Job, uh, that God condemns those three elder men, those three elder supposedly friends of Job. He condemns them. He condemns them for their envy and pride, their jealousy and their hatred of Job. And he tells them they were wrong. I mean, they just, you know, who, who beats up a guy when he's down? Only people that are jealous of you, people who hate you. And that's what they did to Job. They beat him up when he was down. And God, he lets, he lets him know that they did not do right and they didn't speak right. You, that's another point. A lot of the things that these men said in those chapters, God is saying right here at the end of Job, this is not right, this is not true, and you didn't speak truly of me or Job. So some people preach from some of those chapters in Job like they're true, from what some of those men said. And God himself even says, that is not true, and, and you guys were wrong in what you said in Da, 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 da. You know, we need to preach what God says, not what somebody thinks about it, but what God actually said and what's true. We need to remember that. You know, Satan said things about God. The Pharisees said things about God that weren't true. We don't preach those. We shouldn't preach something that somebody said about God that God says himself is not true. We need to remember that. So what does God require of these three, you know, non-friends? Well, let's look there um, in chapter 42. I want us to look there. He requires them, he says, let's look in verses um, 7 through 9. I'm, uh, let's read those together. Job 42, 7 through 9. Um. And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have 
not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams. Go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job will pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Wow. So Eliaphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did as the Lord commanded them, for the Lord had accepted Job. And you'll read there in uh, when God spoke to Job, he he spoke to him face to face like you would to somebody that, uh, that you're in a relationship with that you love, a, a parent or a spouse or a child, where you have close relationship and you have to set some things straight and you have to you know work it out you can see how God spoke to Job but Job's heart was right and these men their hearts were not right and he said you did not speak truly of me man what an accusation I mean what a you know uh, it wasn't just an accusation it was a truth they had not spoken truly of God you know, what a, a witness of that what they did. And so Job sacrificed for his friends and prayed for them. And that was his turning point. When Job prayed for his friends, it tells us right there um, in verse 11, I mean 10, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. That's the key to the people who hurt you. That's the key to the people who stab you in the back. That's the key to the people who betray you. You pray for them. And it's exactly what Jesus taught in the New Testament. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Do good to them. Don't return evil for evil, but instead return good for evil. And it is uh, well known by many, many Bible scholars, they agree on this, that Job's trial lasted for about 9 to 18 months. Not his whole lifetime. Because for one thing, you notice there in um, uh, after he prayed for his friends and God restored everything um, Job uh, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his, his beginning and he had all these sheep and oxen more and da 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 and more sons and daughters and um, Job lived 100 after this after this happened to him he lived 140 years and saw his children and grandchildren for four generations. So see, it didn't last for his whole lifetime. It lasted for a period of time. It was a terrible period of time, but it wasn't like some people think, oh, you know, I'm like Job. My whole life is like this. Job's whole life wasn't like that. It was just a, a trial period. And we must realize who the real blesser is and who the real destroyer is. So I want you to go through the book of Job, read it. Uh, if you want to read it in two or three translations, please, uh, whatever your time permits. And then I will be sending you these questions and answers. God bless you and Lord, open your heart to learn many, many things you didn't see before. And I will uh, be back next week and we'll be looking at the book of Psalms.